Hello, and welcome to Poetry at the Dali. Our series, now in its fifth year, is a matter of great pride to the museum and our community. Curated by Helen Pruitt Wallace, it plums the nature of poetry and human experience and brings complementary themes to our exhibitions. Uh, because of the pandemic, we have been able to invite poets from far afield, and you will be delighted tonight to hear from Major and Dee Dee Jackson, uh, two poets uh, not in our area at the moment. We are very appreciative of the support of uh, the City of St. Petersburg in funding this program, and ever appreciative to our curator of the program, Helen Pruitt Wallace, the Poet Laureate of St. Petersburg. It's our custom to ask Helen to read one of her own poems uh, as we start the readings, and we will ask her to do that tonight. Helen? Thank you, Hank, and thanks to all of you all for joining us uh, this evening for the Dolly Poetry Series. We have a terrific program for you. Um, this evening we have Dee Dee and Major Jackson uh, reading with us for our National Poetry Month um, program and we're so excited to have them both here. Um, I will, as Hank has asked, start with one poem um, and I wanted to read this one because it's one that I think ties into our current exhibit, our Van Gogh exhibit, which if you haven't seen it, I hope you all will try to make it into the museum. Um, and, and see this really incredible um, exhibit. The poem has an epigraph from a book called The Secret Lives of Color, and it's by a woman named Cassia St. Clair. And in it, she notes that the color yellow, which of course was one of Van Gogh's very favorite colors, um, was a color used in France during the mid 19th century for sensationalist literature. Um, and, and it became a kind of symbol for modernity and the aesthetic and decadent movements. Um, for Van Gogh and for other artists at the time, uh, color itself um, came to stand as the symbol of the age and also their rejection of sort of repressed Victorian values. Um, so this poem is called Absorbing Light and it has an epigraph by Philip Ball. What we see as color is the remains after the material has absorbed its own private and unique chime. This city with blaring graffiti and souped up cars and crowded parking lots unrolls streets like bolts of gauze. It offers up flowers in a park, the smell of fresh baguettes, corner jazz and sirens, ever sirens to remind us of the pitch of pain. I stroll these sidewalks the way I move my hands across the pale back of my beloved, looking for a warmth called home. We each relive a thousand small evictions, and all around me hunger bears its teeth, and vacant stairs and shuffled shopping carts, the gaping soles of mismatched leather shoes. But look how the mystery of color throbs sweetly from every neon sign. How matter absorbs its chimes of light, deserts the rest. And beauty's born in hues of this rejection. It pulses through the night in yellow, blue. Does what we have make us who we are or what we lose? So, <laughs> Thank you, Major. <laughs> um, so with great pleasure, I want to introduce uh, Major Jackson. Major is the author of The Absurd Man, a book that you all need to get. Um, and tombelowbooks.com stands ready um, to uh, order this book for you. And so you can get, go online and, and find it there. You can also find it soon in our museum bookstore. So. His edited volumes include Best American Poetry 2019, Ranga for Obama, and Library of America's County Cullen Collected Poems. 
He's the Gertrude Conway Vanderbilt Chair in the Humanities at Vanderbilt University. And he serves as the poetry editor for the Harvard Review. And I had the good fortune of meeting both Major and his wife, Dee Dee, um, several years ago at the Eckerd Writers Conference. And it's, it's just such a pleasure to have you um, now joining us for this program. And we hope at some point you'll come back again and join us in the theater. <laughs> so welcome, Major. Thank you, Helen. And uh, I want to start off by saying it's such a, a joy and pleasure to read on behalf and under the auspices of the Dali Museum and want to thank everyone there, Hank and Sarah and everyone else who made it uh, possible for Didi and I to share our poetry. Uh, but most especially, I want to thank my friend uh, Helen Wallace, fine poet, as we just heard, and uh, really thrilled with, um, uh, with this uh, event and a way of deepening um, both our friendship and brotherhood, sisterhood, uh, uh, in the arts, very grateful uh, for this opportunity. Mm -hmm. I uh, decided to uh, read some poems uh, that have over the years inspired me. Um, art teaches us, teaches us to see, and that's, as you know, um, a crucial uh, skill set. Um, if one is to be a writer of, of many uh, worth and merit, and uh, I've had the fortunate um, privilege of growing up near the Philadelphia Museum of Art, which I can definitely say is part of the foundation for um, where I am today. So I want to read some of those poems and I'll read from uh, The Absurd uh, Man, but I thought I would start with this uh, poem titled How to Listen, How to Listen. I'm going to cock my head tonight like a dog in front of McGlinchey's tavern on Locust. I'm going to stand beside the man who works all day, combing his thatch of gray hair, corkscrewed in every direction. I'm going to pay attention to our lives, unraveling between the forks of his fine tooth comb. For once, we won't talk about the end of the world, or Vietnam, or his exquisite paper shoes. For once, I'm going to ignore the profanity and the dancing and the jukebox so I can hear his head crackle beneath the sky's stretch of faint stars. I'd like to um, start with that poem chiefly because um, I do believe art urges us, as Gwendolyn Brooks says, um, on voyages, but it also um, urges us to pay attention, uh, to notice the particularities and the details and the texture of our lives, how to listen. That was that poem. And it's from my first book, uh, Leaving uh, Saturn. Uh, let's see. I, there is a poem in my second book called Hoots um, that is inspired by a painting um, titled The Moorish Chief. And that was painted by Edouard Charlemont. Uh, but uh, the start of this, this poem um, owes itself to a childhood memory in which um, a teacher uh, who found it difficult to pronounce the names of the students, decided to rename them after French painters. It's from my sequence, Urban Renewal, number 17. What of my fourth grade teacher at Reynolds Elementary, who weary after failed attempts to set to memory names strange and meaningless as grains of dirt around the mouthless mountain caves at Bahrain, Karai, Tariq, Shaniqua, Amari, Aisha, nicknamed the entire class after French painters, whether boy or girl. Behold, the beginning of sentient formless life. And so my best friend Darnell became Marcel and TT was Brock. 
and Stacy James was Fragonard, and I, Eduard Charlemont. The time has come to look at these signs from other points of view. Days passed in activity before I corrected her, for Eduard was Austrian and painted the Black Chief in the palace in 1878 to the question whether intelligence exists. All of Europe swooned to Venus of Willendorf, outside her tongue, yet of it. In textbooks, Herodotus tells us of the legend of Siswasret, Egyptian, colonizer of Greece, founder of Athens. What's in a name? Sagas rise and fall in the orbs of jump ropes. Hannibal grasps a Roman monkey bar on history's rung. And the mighty heroes at recess lay dead in woe on the imagined battlefields of the halo. I haven't read that poem in a, a very long time. I was happy to uh, come to that. Um, because I think we still are processing some of what some people have uh, deemed microaggressions. I knew something was wrong even back then uh, to be renamed a French painter in this urban school in North Philadelphia. Um, this, um, this poem is also taken from Urban Renewal, um, number 25, actually. And this is about um, visiting the Vatican uh, Museum and coming across what I saw as a pattern uh, there. And my trip to uh, Europe has been some of the most nourishing uh, uh, events in my life, but it also instigates fine questions. 25, Urban Renewal number 25, Italy from the Augustan Suite for Derek Walcott. And it begins with this epigraph. The blessed will not care what angle they are regarded from. W.H. Auden. Cobbled streets have the burnished look of stone skulls, sinking like a necropolis of ungalinos from centuries of bewildered tourists stumped in the eternal city, mulling over which way to turn. Every ruin begets a selfie, like a Hollywood set directed to life, then ditched with each phone's shutter click. Past the bronze facade of the Colosseum, ominous as a chip gold tooth, other crowds follow like apostles, the voice of a guide yawning and carrying her flag aloft like a cross. Even here, I look for a history of myself. In the Musée Vaticani, I zoom close to arts record, frescoes, sculptures, altar pieces, and war with pilgrims for the best shot, studying the prose of a guidebook to explain Ezekiel's amphora, the slave boy delivering clothes to a nude Pollux, or why every Christ child craves the adoration of a black magus. Shades frozen in a single hole. The crumbling stone beneath our feet speaks to us. Even Rome's dust possesses something of human grandeur, the elegance of decay. I envy the triumph that certain paintings give back my face. But Romanus Pontifex almost sealed my fate. I have more hills to climb. From every gift shop, Papa waves at his blessed lambs. Museum going. <laughs> uh, yeah, let me uh, read a poem that uh, also taken from a book called Road Deep. And since the Dolly Museum is situated there in beautiful Florida, I thought I would read this poem called On Cocoa Beach. I am revisiting the idea of Florida 
giving my vertebrae a vacation from all the faded bouquets of urine in New York and the darkened policies of snow in Vermont. I'm revisiting the idea of my wife's imperial gaze. Her three cheese quiche and fluted mimosas are the masters of my mornings. I'm revisiting the idea of lawn furniture. By late afternoon on Sunday, my face blossoms like a passion of lilies as I admire the spectral grace of the sand hill crane or am caught lost thinking of Castillo de San Marcos and the first people Temaqua. I am revisiting the idea of light and laughter and skin half transported by wind. I like to think of myself beside the crepe myrtle pondering the logos of palm leaves and the kindnesses of beaches. You can have your sororities of pain and darken subways. I will give myself to the great battles of clouds and surfs. We truly do enjoy our return to uh, Florida. Uh, so here is a poem uh, called Points of Clarification, and, and it references uh, a poet who recently passed away, um, whose work I can confidently say was truly important in my growth as a poet, uh, Adam Zagajewski. Points of Clarification. And though I say here sorrow beguiles me, I lose no sleep, and though I say our country's journey is one long rigmarole, its villages and ridges are succulent and sweet. And though I say here, watch me now, watch me. Truly, I'm shy as stage curtains, demure as tiny cups of espresso. And though I quote Wordsworth, Zagajewski, and Dow, I come from gunshots and beatdowns. Raw and dirty, the day was mild. The light was generous. And though I've said in the past, I wear September on my face, which is eternal. I treasure to June morning soaked in song. July's fevered cauldron wilting us like seared spinach. And though we say darkness succumbs to the light, I've been reading Faust, questioning the morality of knowledge. Our icebergs and mountains auctioned earth collapsing, human flesh for money, crickets barking loud as generals. And though we say, I do unto deaf do on cue, I'll forever hold her, a jewelry box in my lap full of prayers and stays against confusion. And though they say, world without religions, without revelations, instant, instinct, effaced by reason. I swear I can reach up and touch your laughter. Here's another uh, poem that uh, references art of some kind. When you're young, you're all about the avant-garde. <laughs> There's that spirit of resistance and also um, a desire to kind of change the sound we, we dress for. How we said it back then, the avant-garde. We could hear salvation breaking over the highways. We cared little of moderation. We walked into bars and clubs like matadors and never believed the songs would go out of us. We spent too much time picturing the night sky slow march. Orpheus gave us courage, especially in Brazil. Enraged at cages, endless speeches of rain carved us. Seeing the, the word award, we thought awkward. We understood the surrealists. Pencils rained in our dreams like prologues. Surely we were a gift for believers. We erupted appropriately at concerts and readings like De Carico. We clapped for the mannequins takeover. 
their balance, hugs, and flight. I said to myself, someday I will not follow this reedy band of defiance. Someday I will sculpt myself out of stone. I will get past all this singing. Okay, a few poems from The Absurd Man. And I wanna uh, start with uh, another <laughs> art reference poem. This one is uh, Holbein's The Ambassadors makes an appearance right at the very end. The Absurd Man on Object Petit A. In movies, the bad guy stands off face to face with the good guy. They are wanted in each other's town, but we know as moviegoers, they are the same person and could win a lookalike contest if one were more famous than the other. Our recognition of form and content or Lacan's mirror stage takes us above the clouds in the late style of mid-century Dutch chairs and talk analysis. The two would do well to lick the other's birthmarks, except for desire is two pistols observed in an optical field maison en bin, forming a kind of blissed out symmetry, or so thinks Major. In the 1970s advertisement, a woman lays on the glassy hood of a Fiat spider this too requires us to stand oblique to our own image. Ponder, for example, Holbein's The Ambassadors. Nobody wins. This poem <laughs> has that famous image of American Gothic. And I, I have to say, we're gonna talk craft in a minute, but what fun it was to I rhyme American spirit, the cigarettes with American Gothic. Washington Square, urban renewal number, tw number 26. <clears throat> when all that cautions the eyes toward the imminent slide of autumn to Arctic winds, the canopy of English elm and sycamore leaves, like colored coins fall and widen a hole, letting more light spill in. Heaven's alms to earth, whose ashen gray and white will soon be all the rage. Our guilty secret is the baby grand playing glasses or fee suite for piano. Nearby, Bhutto dancers writhe and almost upstage with white painted faces of horror, portraits of Nagasaki. And past the fountain's water plumes, a drug riddled couple sh shares the smoldering remains of an American spirit. Their grizzled dog roped to a shopping cart and frayed duffel bag, this city's updated version of American Gothic. Our reddish hair pianist lets the melancholic notes float to high rises on fifth above its triumphal arc, like a film in reverse, where the golden foliage is read by a poet as autumn's light pours in. Don't get around much anymore. The ink spots Decca cover spins on a phonograph, an era spiraling soft then held by his gentle pen. And this is called Fish and Wildlife. Not so much a poem about art, but um, a poem that takes place where I am now in Vermont. Um, ice fishing um, eludes me as a activity that one would want to take up, particularly in the coldest time of the winter. But here in Vermont, it is an activity, it is a sport, I guess. Fish and wildlife. 
the lake's cold shacks of ice fishing anglers speed by like homeless sh shanties. This is North Country, where a cabin's fireplace wears moose antlers, where the mesmeric drift of snow snakes Route 30, sending a chalk white F-150 plummeting into a ditch. Icicles hover above like liquid spears. A shawl neighbor in silhouette could be a witch, but you believe in the company of man and seek a cold beer and the crackling fire of a bar up the road, whose patrons talk of deadly snowmobiles steams its front window. Gossip turns the evening darker. And the nation might as well be this small, shadowy room, half in hunting gear, eyeing the woman holding a cue at a halo pool table. Outside, a grumbling snowplow barrels up the street like a middle linebacker. A truckload of modern furniture sits in the parking lot. Yep, someone says to a patriot's loss. Should have won that one. The almost bare streets seem clutched in ice, wind dusting up crystals, an orange street light. Old men in Franklin County dream of being touched. The events around Flo <coughs> George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, um, rightly uh, spawned a number of poems in reaction to uh, what really is state-sanctioned violence against unarmed citizens. This is titled, uh, Think of Me Laughing. You're right to imagine me sobbing on the corner of 6th Avenue and West 4th, or raising a hashtagged cardboard above my head near the Liberty Bell. You're right to picture me lying down below the gold doom capital demanding don't shoot. It is my annual day of sobbing. What are these brown hands for if not to bury my eyes in the ancient rivers of wrongs? And isn't this my consigned single note in our final piece of music, mindless as a blink? So go ahead. You and I are once again rehearsing decency. It is the dream of loving fruited plains that do not love you back. It is our feet planted in concrete that has me weep. But first, give thought to my luxuries. The sunset I toasted over the Val de Schiana with an aperitivo in Cafe Poliziano, the summer of 15. Or give thought to the promontories of conversation with my father yesterday, in which among other delights, we discussed the dignity of eggplants, whose purplest tint reminded him of a great aunt. Consider my love of celestial bodies. You're better off thinking of me singing this morning, a little Marvin Gaye. Not what's going on, but I love you. I want you, sultry and soulful. A one-way love is just a fantasy. Oh, sugar. Forgive me for being bound up in the ecstatic right now. I do not regret my little bout with life. And I will end with a poem from Urban Renewal, I mean, from The Absurd Man, titled Double Major. Which has some embedded um, references to art. Double major. I emerge when he confuses a lamp for a moon. It is then he thinks of fine bindings and ordered Athenaeums. I own his face, but he washes and spends too little time behind his ears. He sees me in the mirror behind thick clouds of shaving cream then suddenly believes in ghosts. His other selves are murals in the cave of his mind. They are speechless yet large. They stare his wishes 
like summer rain and amplify his terrors like newscasters. What he doesn't know, his dreams are his father's dreams, which are his grandfather's dreams and so on. They possessed a single wish. He knocks repeatedly on the bolted door to his imagination. Tragically, he believes he can mend his wounds with his poetry. And thus, I am his most loyal critic. He trots me out like a police dog. He calls out thirst for pads and pencils destiny. Our voices come together like two wings of a butterfly. On occasion, he closes his eyes and sees me. I am negative capability. The test to all men are created equal. We are likely to dance at weddings against my will. He pulled out the same moves writing this poem, a smooth shimmy and a hop. This page is a kind of looking glass making strange whatever stone carvings he installed along the narrow road to his interior. I suffer in silence, wedded to his convictions. He would like to tell you the truth about love, but we are going to bed, to bed. Thank you. I'm looking forward to hearing Dee Dee. That was terrific. Major, that was that was wonderful. Thank you so much for reading those fabulous um, poems. And I, um, you know, you read a couple of lines I really especially loved. I swear I can reach up and touch your laughter. Wow, <laughs> such a great line. And also, I do not regret my little bout with life. You know, it just is just so, so poignant and perfect. And um, and then the the terrific poems about art. So thank you. I'm glad you read from several of your books. So, and Dee Dee, welcome. We're, we are so glad that you also can join us um, for the Dolly Poetry Series. Thank you for um, being with us to read, I'm sure several different poems, but many maybe also, I hope from your fabulous book, Moon Jar. Um, so we really appreciate your being part of this. And uh, I, I want you both to know, we claim you in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we look forward to having you back down here as soon as as soon as possible. So, and Didi, you actually did you grew up um, in Central Florida, correct? I did, I did. And it's funny, I was listening to Major, who curated some poems about art. I have a few about art, but I curated some poems about Florida. Oh, good. <laughs> Good. Good. There's several that, yeah, there's several that show up in the book. So I thought I would read some. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Um, well, just a brief bio um, about Dee Dee Jackson. She is the author um, of this book, Moon Jar. Again, you can get it through tumblobooks.com, also um, from our museum bookstore, which will be carrying um, both of these um, books. Um, and Moon Jar was published in 2020 by Red Hen Press. Um, and her poems have appeared in the New Yorker, the New, York, the New England Review, and the Kenyon Review. Fabulous publications all. Um, she lives in Nashville, Tennessee, and teaches creative writing at Vanderbilt. So welcome, um, Dee Dee. It's a real pleasure to have you, to have you here. So. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Thank you for the invitation. I want to thank the Dolly Museum for putting on or helping to promote this um, reading series that seems just fabulous. And I was... Um, I'm just honored to be able to be a part of it, you know, today, tonight. So I know I'm reading in the daytime, but it'll be, it'll be aired in the evening. So, and thank you for everybody who is tuning in to, to, uh, to listen to our reading. Um, it's wonderful. So thank you. Thank you. I, yeah, I did think I would um, start off with reading some books from Moonjar, art books. Yeah. Poems from Moonjar. And then I'll, I'll end on a handful of newer poems that are, um, kind of forming a new collection and one that's super, super new. I always love reading like something that I've, like the thing I wrote most recently. I think it's kind of fun to do that because it's scary, but also, you know, you get to hear that, that new poem out loud. So um, I thought that'd be nice to do. And I'll try to keep, I'll keep track of that time. Um, so I'm going to start off with the title poem, which is my last poem, funny enough, but I think it's a nice opener kind of sets the, the tone for the book. Moon jar. My wedding ring is missing one small diamond and I like it that way. A reminder of the imperfect in all of us, like that keyhole size of grief that remains crystalline. 
In Korea, ceramicists for centuries have made moon jars, testimony to the virtue of modesty, asymmetrical warping on the wheel, slumping in the pine heated kiln, impurities when fired, black dots and pox on its surface like freckles on skin. I have been kept awake so many nights from the moon, its pull on the pines and night birds, and who, like a monk, keeps a sharp order of time. Never a perfect sphere, the milky moon jar joins two clay hemispheres into one. When the light of the moon finds me, I am the color of everything in the winter night. Kill all lies. That line comes from um, uh, 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 some graffiti. I wouldn't even say it's graffiti, um, but it was a, these words scrawled across um, Guernica, uh, Picasso's piece. So when it was vandalized, um, and so I was just fascinated with anybody who would want to vandalize an amazing piece of art like that. But um, then also this idea of kill all lies. So after his death, my hair did not grow. My nails did not grow. They peeled and flaked. My bones were lifted into a sack upon my legs. Even my muscles decayed from the lack of wild oranges and sweet tea. This was the new myth of my life. When visiting Spain, a cricket was loose in my kitchen. Its chirp was like my name, like the words, yes, yes. But what could a dead woman know of yes? That summer, one cricket became two, two became four. It was then I memorized the trill and grind of my name. Like a vandal with a can of red spray paint, I could scrawl the words, kill lies all across my Guernica. Who will be the bull, the horse? Who the severed head and arm? Under the bald lamp, like an eye, I will expose old scars and breastfeed the shadow of myself. Let's see. Slip. The cat slips out the window. The thread slips past the eye. The sun slips into the stratus. The letter S slips past my tongue. The lead slips beyond the drip drop of the Y. A steel pyramid slipped in and out of utility knife. The blade slipped into the skin of his wrist and neck. The whisper song of Jays slips from beak to beak tree to tree. He slipped down the bathroom wall. I slip on ice I do not see. The temperature slips below zero. Our photo slips from its place in the flame frame. The river slips past the storm down tree. I slipped past a wedge of light to enter the morgue. I let it slip, suicide. The blooms of the lilacs slip into a purple and white parade. At the end of the day, I slip out of my body. Uh, my next poem, I, um, so I, I am currently living in Nashville. I was living in Vermont. <laughs> and before that, I was living in Florida. Um, and so I still do get down to Florida with the pandemic, of course, that hasn't happened. Um, I have family there and my mom um, and her husband live in New Smyrna Beach in Florida. So this is titled After a Visit to New Smyrna Beach, Florida. Even the ocean's relentless roar can be a kind of wail. The stars above the breakers, tiny archipelagos of agony. I can grieve here or in the north. At dawn, crows gather at the ocean's edge, such a contrast to the day's white gulls who, paperly and weightless, hover above the whimper and moan of the shoreline. I don't like to write about the ocean. It reveals its emotions too easily. But here I am, 
closer to the place of your death than I prefer to be. It rains every afternoon and thunderheads build like ashy skyscrapers. The ocean litters its shores with its dead that visitors collect in buckets and pockets and carry home. I never buried you. Instead, I gave the urn to your family. You believed in no God. I believed in the clockwork of waves. Still do, I guess. Hoping they somehow will hurry time, or at least for now, definite. Summer. We call it heat lightning when summer nights camera flash the silhouettes of the already black thunderheads and lightning threads the cloth of the sky. No clap, no roll, just silence and show. His body was rigid and deaf and cold from storage. In a week, the blood had pooled in unexpected places. The pattern of small incisions like drops of dried honey. I remember him in life as easily as in death before he was yellow and hollow. This is the problem with the living. We think the night has its own wings, comes to us nodding like a storm buoy. We think the silence keeps us safe from the lightning. A candle and a blanket are all we think we need. But in the morning, we are the ones left to sweep away the scorched wings of moths. Um, I, one of the things I really miss are the, the sandhill cranes. And in the neighborhood I lived in, in Florida, there were always, uh, pairs that would have chicks and it was always exciting to see them grow from these fuzzy little things to teenage versions of themselves. <laughs> and then hopefully, um, you know, full on adults and go on, um, and it was always heartbreaking though, when there was two chicks, there's often two born and then you'd only see one a couple of days later. So that was always heartbreaking, but I missed the sandhill crane. And so this is a poem about the Florida sandhill crane. By wings whose shapes are but half a heart, feathers oiled with country clubs and gasps of delight. Not for these, the sandhill crane shakes her beaded voice gauche and gangrene. She is the gatekeeper of jibe, a cement gray song edged and pocked in grassy fields, a frock of scarlet over her eye, her own letter to time and her maker, a bow, a leap, all a dance to the heavens and the blue plastic tarps mapping the devil in a state of wind and rain, a crucifix in her throat to scratch the itch of her fable. Fruit flies darn the citrus fallen and rotten in the late spring. She sidesteps and heads for the wetlands to a river that flows north, pierced with blossoms and the song of Marseilles, a white suprematist's white on white, blossoms on flesh. Small Corinthian dreams gargle in her throat, her voice of leaves and muck folded up in an awkward flight, a freeze of battles and victories lining the sky, as if in a couplet of straight lines, as if she could know she would wed the palette of one into a mural of two. That poem ends my first section in that book that's really about um, uh, the uh, trauma of, of me coming to terms with the suicide of my late husband. Um, and so I'll read a couple of poems from the last section, um, which is finding new love, which is, a, is um, a rebirth in a way, I guess. So um, listen, like a hundred gray ears, the river stones are layered in a pile near the shed where morning doves hawk their slow, their peck and bobble to listen to a chorus of listening. Small buds on the lilac perk up. A cardinal's torpedoed call comes in slow waves of four, round after round. It's a love call, a call to make him known to himself. 
The stones listen harder, decipher the song, attempt to offer back its echo, but fail. This is not a poem of coming spring. This is a poem well aware that gray flesh is dead flesh. All the riping, ripe listening comes at a cost. The first sky is in all skies. The first song is in all songs. I was also trying to um, honor the season. And so I was also looking for spring poems too. <laughs> I tend to write a lot about seasons um, and I, I have a lot of spring. I must be really excited when spring comes. And that probably comes from living in Vermont where those winters are very long and the spring is very delayed. So I was very excited to see new buds on the tree any chance I can. Um, and I'll read one last poem from my book. Um, and it's titled, if I could find it, there it is. With Major on Hawk Mountain which was where he's reading from today. In the early evening, the sky blushes at our close attention. We can't take our eyes off of it as two morning doves lift and land near our empty feeder paired for life. The male lilts a coo. His breast mirrors the pink above us. I begin to hum a song, something about icons and suitcases. Last summer, I collected the dead monarch that now rests like a medieval relic on the yellow paper on my desk. One wing is split in two, a female with thick coal veins and no black dot on the hind wings, like Tiffany glass, all pitch and fire. The milkweed she ate all summer turned her blood to poison for her predators. Now her wings are as brittle as book pages left in the rain and dried in the sun. The summer my previous husband took his life, I thought each monarch in our garden was a sign. Not so, dead is dead. The flush mountains now look as if they want a short nap, might come to life later with the moonlight. Even the dove has quieted into his shared nest. Um, I do miss the peepers. So um, these little frogs that have this X on the back, on their backs, um, just really create a beautiful chorus um, at sunset. And this, this poem is titled for those spring peepers in Vermont. I try to record their song lifting from pines and birches, one solitary note, shrill, then three, trill, trill, then 12 or 20, all at once like a reunion of women at a kitchen table, my aunts and grandmothers with wine in hand and cigarettes bouncing to the syllables of the names in their stories, their ash flick of grief. Why is dusk so melancholy? A vesper of tree frogs begins with or without me. I often sit and watch the end of the day turn to steely gray. Those women each claim their widowhood. Like the X on the back of the peeper, we are all marked one way or the other. Maybe we carry a sign from birth, maybe from far away. Each woman in my family has buried a husband. In that line, I am the last. Bits of night begin to unravel as the song swells and slowly covers the sky. Two Mule Deer. It's a spilling title, so the title moves right into that, into that next line. It's two Mule Deer walked past my window this morning, female, I think, no antlers as the day moon pressed like a faded thumbprint into the bare back of the Santa Cruz mountains and the meadow of wild rye and wand buckwheat rocked in the new light. All hide and eyes and hunger moving with caution and blaze. Is there a coming of good? As if their path was already decided, I 
I watch them step into the day, black tail tipped and wide eared. So much of what I want isn't even about me. Yesterday, a friend said the sight of deer means danger is clear. No coyote or mountain lions nearby. Still, I remember what it feels like to be a sidewalk, a sudden girl tamped down at an all night party, fingered then dropped by a boy who will be dishonorably discharged from the army only two years later. You know how it feels wanting to walk into the rain and disappear. While hiking, a photographer found two deer legs about 100 feet apart, cloven hooves and dew claws intact, adapted for fleeing predators, left by a hunter. We are only what we are. Don't pity me. A slight steam rises from the backs of the deer as they move past the black oaked edge into the white light, lifting their eyes to the tree line, then to my window, then to the sky, hooves striking the ground over and over like syllables in a low staccato voice. Um, so I've been suffering from migraines and I've, I'm tempted to write some migraine poems. So I'm gonna read a, two migraine poems, not tempted, I guess more like uh, called to write these migraine poems. And I do get migraine with aura which in itself is pretty amazing. It's almost like a psychedelic moment. I can imagine, I think about people who might've had aura in, in, in history and they didn't know what was happening because it's this really amazing experience. And, and, I, and I, I just like to watch it and experience it, but then yet I know, unfortunately, what's coming, which is the pain, which isn't funny, but you know, you have this really beautiful moment and then followed by pain. So I have a couple of migraine poems and then I'll probably end on one last poem um, on spring. So migraine, shard glint of light on the sill, run on line of daybreak at the hem of the front door, incandescent orb in the bathroom, torch of ice in the freezer. These numberless galaxies of light, all danger, Wasp sting, gin burn, gold plated bangles too tightly wound around my wrist. My eyes lined with black coal like the ancients. They will be volcan volcanic rims, right to left, top, bottom, peacocks cry, cocks comb, a flamed flower, edible, burning, receding, receding. I am sure there's a candle under my skin on the right side of my face. Its flame moves from my jaw to cheekbone, high cheekbone, not flaming cheekbones, zygomatic bone, yolk. When the war's over, I'll untie the knot of my brain. I'll use tweezers like when I untangle gold chains. My right arm is numb except for my heartbeat, fleshy and heavy. Where is the darkness in this day? All the light will be smaller tomorrow. In this way, I feel closer to the dead. And my next, this poem is, it's titled, What You See is What You See. And that's a quote from Frank Stella, the hard edge um, painter. What you see is what you see. Frank Stella would be proud of my migraines, especially those that come after sex exquisite pleasure, then blindness with hard edged jagged lines with dago colors that grow into a barbed crescent eating at one side of my head until it passes like a lit up road sign, paracentral, mid peripheral, far peripheral, gone. Then the viri picks up the flute outside my window and I can hear every tiny whirl inside the metal pipe of its throat a song some in the 19th century called seductive. And finally, I can find my clothes and smell the ground coffee we made hours ago, sheets pungent with sweat, the rain a few miles away. Under this geometric spell and pills like wasps beneath my tongue, I am the closest to my true self, 
and I secretly love my agony, just as I love the blue webbing of veins on my legs, wrinkles like tidal ripples on my face. I know that the pain will come and eventually go. The birches grow still before the storm. They like, like they want to hear us, like they are voyeurs listening in to both kinds of my ecstasy. And I'll finish with a new poem, which is um, here on my laptop. So it's titled Spring. Um, it's super, super, super new. Spring. See how the breeze opens its arms to the young birch, keeps the mornings cool enough for fogged breath, but heats the day like convection. If it rains, you can bet the dead will applaud from six feet below. Everyone wants to be born again and again. These days swing like pendulums between now and forever, between nudity of trees and the sudden shock of yellow daffodils, their tiny six-petaled trumpets proclaiming the coming of honeyed days, clouds like bolts of rickrack lace cutting across the sky, my breath like a saved envelope of child's hair opening at night next to your deep breathing. All right, thank you, thanks. Well, thank you, Dee Dee. That was a wonderful reading. Um, God, so many, so many powerful poems, so many poignant poems. And I'm glad you also read your spring poems. So um, yeah, um, I don't know. Can you both hear me okay? Are you both unmuted? I am now, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so we're gonna, um, we are going to segue into um, just our Q and A for about fifteen minutes, and um, you know I'm going to kind of throw out some questions, but I also welcome this to be a kind of free flowing conversation um, about poetry and art and um, and craft, especially. Um, but I want to start. You know, I, I I notice, of course, that there are some some ways in which your poems are similar, and that they both, as I read them, here are kind of probing. Um, you know, for who we are, who we were once, who we are now, and um, and where does that carry us, and what does it mean, and how do we make meaning from it? And even though you come at your poems maybe very differently in some ways, um, I, I'm hearing such wonderful reflection going on, even as you weave the outer world um, into your poems. I think that's hard to do. Uh, it's hard to write intensely personal poems that also still reach out toward the world. And mm -hmm. I love how both of you um, do that in your poems, um, but. I'm wondering if you can both talk a little bit about that. And Major, we'll start with you. If you could just maybe take a few minutes to talk about your process for writing poems. Um, it can be your new book, maybe your, your earlier books as well. Um, how do you get from the idea of a poem into fleshing it out and even a little bit in your revision process? Can you talk a little bit about that? Mm -hmm. uh, how's my volume? Perfect. Okay, good. Well, I will... Um say that uh, for for the most part, it's a bit of a mystery, uh, most of it. But once I'm inside the heat of writing, I, um, I kind of relish that that space of of making. Um, mm -hmm. Poems begin for me sometimes with a phrase. Uh, I've even had dreams give me words or phrases that yeah. feel like some sort of assignment from, from the universe. Um, or, and I'm, I'm happy to hear you said what you said about even the most personal poems tend to reach out. Mm -hmm. I think for the most part, and I, I wonder if Didi will agree with this, so much of our work is an attempt to um, uh, maybe not on the surface make meaning, but also, but just to kind of understand why certain memories, for example, stick with us or why certain words yeah. kind of call us. So uh, as you know, I, I tend to write, you know, fairly between um, a, a more kind of formal sensibility, but also I'm driven by the line as a measure of music. Mm -hmm. um, and on a number of occasions, I've just given myself, particularly with the urban renewal poems, um, a kind of formal constraint to kind of write 
somewhere between a 16 line to 24 line poem that reaches out, at least with this sequence, that reaches out to about a 10 to 12 beat line. Wow. And I've been doing that for years now. And part of it is just, you know, for the basketball player who goes to the hoop five in the morning, just taking jump size. That's just mm -hmm. me practicing so that when inspiration does come without those uh, particular formal um, uh, boundaries, the music is first and foremost in the writing. So no matter the, the subject, I can definitely say that I am keen on that. Uh, another way of bridging to the reader is, as I said earlier, I think it's just so crucial to concretize the world in our poems. The, the experience of living is uh, owed to our very visceral sense of, of what we do day to day, what we eat, music we listen to, mm -hmm. the conversations that we inhabit. So a lot of my poems uh, in a way is like putting up a mic to life around me and mm -hmm. trying to find the words that, is, that are going to replicate those moments um, as viscerally and as vivid as, as possible. Yeah. Yeah, I had, I was, I have, sorry, I'm sorry, Helen, go ahead. No, 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 I wanted you to go next. Yeah, please. Oh, I was going to say, I had a friend of mine say about my work, um, oh, we can, you know, what Didi was doing <laughs> when she was writing, the, right away before she was writing the poem or, you know, because it's so true. So much of what I have immediately just done or what I'm immediately doing finds its way into the poem. Um along with other things, along with memories, like Major was saying, or whatever, if you have a topic, I don't often have a topic that I'm going to intentionally write about. I tend to um, start with an image. My, my, I'm kind of image driven. Um, and so I often have an image that I think is um, really interesting. I'm also very much, very much in love with uh, figurative language, particularly metaphor. And so I might just find something that I, I just something I noticed that kind of, I think I walk through the world in that way. So I even constantly have this kind of like uh, voice inside my head. I thought everybody had this, <laughs> but maybe it's just me. I don't know. Maybe it's just a few of us, but then I have a dialogue that's going on inside my head. And so I will be, I'll be making metaphors as I'm just driving down the road or walking to campus or whatever. Yeah. Um, and so I'll try to remember that or write it down or maybe record it. And then it finds its way. Maybe it's a good start to a poem or, um, but I don't often know where I'm going inside that poem. That's the, that's the fun part of writing. Um, and I'm really glad about that. I love that it's my own self-discovery and I'm, I don't know who said it once, but if they're like, if you're not surprised by your poem, then no one else is going to be either. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Yeah. that's you. Yeah. That, so that's, um, and it's, I was just, and, and as far as re connecting to readers, um, I was just listening to a reading with Ed Edward Hirsch yesterday, and he mentioned, and I love this idea of, and he was quoting somebody else. I don't know if it was Paul Salon that he was quoting. I can't remember that, but, um, and uh, he was talking about how writing poems is like putting a message in a bottle and you just, and I, and I, and of course we shouldn't be doing that these days because the ocean is uh, polluted enough. We don't need to be adding <laughs> to pollution to the pollution to the ocean. Um, but uh, it, but I like that idea that I really have to just work on what I am, what I feel like I need to work on, and I have to send it out there. And yeah. maybe one person will see it, maybe nobody will see it, maybe right. hundreds of people will see. It. Who knows, right? right. So right, yeah. 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 No, I love I love that. And I, I love that you talked about it as a dialogue that's constantly your figurative work, especially uh, a dialogue that's constantly running in your head. And and it seems to me that that is one of the ways it, it becomes a dialogue because of all the strong images you put in your poems, both of you. And because of your use of figurative language, because it, it feels to me like that's how the rest of us enter into your poems, you know, mm. because we know the world through our senses. You know, when you're so, when you're describing these images um, and and using the figurative language, we're able to not only read the words but actually to experience the words with you. I think you both do that so so well. And I love that you had a veery in your poem. Oh. <laughs> That's one of my all-time favorite words. In fact, it's 
the ringtone on my cell phone. <laughs> oh, nice. Oh, I might have to look for that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Although I may be time for me to change it. It's getting a little much. <laughs> when I hike in North Carolina and I have that going, they, they, they nest a lot um, where we go in North Carolina. And um, if I get a phone call, I think it you know really is very destabilizing <laughs> for all the nested birds. <laughs> yeah. But um, so I'm interested, if you don't mind my circling back, Major, to your comment about how you often start, and you've been doing this for many years, um, with the number of beats sort of in mind or kind of tucked away so that you know. So are, are you so are you saying that when you sit down to write a poem, you actually have this kind of soundtrack, a certain number of beats that whatever your idea is, is going to sort of fill out to that number of, 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 of beats and or syllables? Or is that what you mean? Do you really start with that, or does that come back into play in a revision where you've realized, okay, the, the line's too long, I'm gonna shave it back, or um, could you talk just a little bit more about that? Yeah, with the, particularly with Urban Renewal, mm -hmm. um, it's a, it is a, a poem that I've been writing for years. There's, and, um, and yes, I, I decided that I would not go beyond uh, 12 syllables Mm -hmm. line. I mean, on some cases it does go, but for the most part, I'm somewhere between 10 to 12 syllables for, per line, which is in our language close to a, um, a pentameter or a right. hexameter. And your and so, early drafts come out that way? Or yeah, they do. I kind of write towards that, that <laughs> beat. But here's the thing about that, though, is that if, if one is too rigid, you know, we're not automatons. And so Gotta mess what it I'm up trying to do is kind of naturalize yeah. what I know is a kind of inherent, yeah. kind of naturalize my walk and pace and breathing to that particular measure. Yeah. And hopefully as a result, my voice won't be deformed by it. Mm -hmm. But there's a, there's a certain kind of uh, what I've learned uh, a certain kind of stateliness when you kind of pay attention mm -hmm. uh, to um, to language that is curated that deeply inside a line or the utterance itself, yeah. and uh, and it also cultivates my ear. Mm -hmm. I can hear speeches now in a way, and I mean speeches by politicians by um, uh, uh, folks of the cloth mm -hmm. in such a way that I, I hear their, I hear their meter. Yeah. And someone said to me years ago that when I was much younger, my poems had a particular velocity and speed to them. And he said, when you get older, you're going to notice your meter changing. And it wasn't necessarily a slowing down, but the pacing of one's life impacts how we come to language and how we come to words. And I know this because with my, with my undergraduates, mm -hmm. I can put down before them a poem by Gwendolyn Brooks or Frost, and I have to tell them to modulate their own rhythm to the pacing of the poem. Otherwise, they just want to zoom right through it. And I'm like, hold it, yeah. slow right. down, mm -hmm. breathe, mm -hmm. pause where the pauses are, and right. really listen to this person's mm -hmm. um, walk in the world. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Embody that, take in, that's one of the, I mean, we take in words, we take in their, their, um, their formal meanings, mm -hmm. but when you encounter a poem, you're also ingesting the age in which that poem was written by way of its rhythm, by way of its rhythm and its cadence. Yeah, and and I think both of you do that so well. I mean, your poems are um, both so natural sounding. I mean, you you know, nothing feels forced. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, in fact, if I didn't have it also to, to you know to see on the page, um, I'm not sure I would know that you that you really have stuck to that many beats per line, um, that religiously, if you will, um, because it is so natural and that's really hard to, to pull off. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm a big believer in that as well, but, um, but that fine tuning is, is in, in how you can make it also sound natural. 
Um, and there's so much music in, in your poems too, Dee Dee. Um, you know, you, um, I heard a lot of like off rhyme, a lot of slant rhyme. I hear a lot of assonance and none of them ever sound forced. The, the way you're working with music, the kind of sound work all the way through, I think carries an awful lot of the, the power in your poems. Um, they're beautiful. Um, they're, they're beautiful, they're stunning, um, and they're, they're difficult in many ways because of the, the, the intense emotion. Um, but um, the sound work you're doing is um, just really powerful, I think, um, yeah. for both of you. Um, so then I, I was thinking, with, again, with what you were saying, Major, it made me think of Peter Meinke, who, as you all know, is our, is our state poet laureate here in Florida. Um, and in his wonderful book, The Shape of Poetry, Peter talks about his revision process. And he says that when he's revising a poem, he's never revising toward meaning. Well, he may not have used the word never, but he, I think he may have. But, but really what he's revising toward is the music of the poem. So he goes back and tries to re-enter the poem and with his ear so engaged that he's looking for what needs to be changed according to the ear, um, which I think you were sort of also saying um, in some of your poems that you, that you let the ear kind of guide you. Um, so, yeah, well, on another topic, um, uh, I guess I'm interested in, uh, to what extent you, you both write a lot about different locations. Um, you know, you've got, you've got a lot of places in your poems. You've got a lot of people in your poems as well. Um, but I'm curious, could you talk a little bit about what you see as the role of place in your poems? You've got Vermont, you've got Florida, you've got Paris, you've got, anyway, could you talk a little bit about that? Um, if you, if you see, if you see that as an important part of poetry, how is it in, how is that working in your own poems? Do you want to start, Dee? Sure. I, um, so it's funny, that goes back to kind of the first question, I think, in a way, because it's what I'm experiencing often will come, will, will, will find its way into my work. Yep. And if I'm traveling, when, um, I, I fell in love with traveling young, but also I taught art history for many years. And so I'd often design trips around finding, seeing a cathedral or seeing a certain piece of art that I was teaching that I wanted to see. Um, I love traveling. I love experiencing new places. I'm missing that a lot. Um, I didn't miss it at first because when we first, you know, kind of went down and went into lockdown and you had to be still and quiet. It was also nice just to kind of be still and quiet for the, you know, for a while. Um, but I do miss, I miss traveling. Um, and so because where I am, I write also wherever I am. So I, I, I try to really keep I don't have a rigorous writing habit by any means. I wish it was it was more rigorous, um, but I I do like to to continue to write and um, and I, I I think it's exciting to actually write in different places, and so though all those places and, and find their way in. So when you know when we were in Spain, I'm writing in Spain. When we were in Italy, you know that we we're so fortunate that we can ex, you know experience these places. I was writing um, when we were in Italy and. And then moving to Vermont from Florida was such an extreme uh, shift in um, and not just like temperature, not the obvious, but also just landscape that I just fell in love with learning all the new, all the new birds and plants and trees. And, and, and so all of those things will find their way into my work. Um, yeah, thank you. Major and I have this app on our phone called Seek and um it allows you to take a photo of a plant. If you can catch an animal, do the animal too, but those are kind of harder to get because they're moving around. But, uh, and so we've become obsessed with wildflowers now, which I didn't know that I would really be obsessed with wildflowers, um, but of different regions and different places. And it's right. been fun to see what's here in Tennessee and to see what's different from Vermont and the plants, some are similar, some are different and what's different from Florida. Right. So place I think find is important for me just because I'm physically, I, I write about where I physically am in those, in that, in that moment, in that mindset of when I'm writing. Yeah. I might be able to add to that more, but I don't know. I don't know about you, Major. How do you feel about that? Yeah. I mean, you know, region or place, um, you know, it's, it's one of the important uh, topics, if nothing else, because of the language that it occasions and mm -hmm. the culture and traditions and, being tuned to that, not as a tourist, but someone for whom there is um, a level of attention that that one brings, that newness. Mm -hmm. It's almost a, a, to experience a place is to, in a way, to be reborn. 
And I think that's some of what I hear uh, Didi talking about experiencing uh, different kinds of, of landscapes is there's a, a familiarity, but it's all fresh and all new. And so yeah. we're taken back to that. If I can go biblical again, we're taken back to that Adam, that space of Adam um, mm-hmm. having to uh, acquire the language. And there's, there's something very right. distinct about being an artist and a writer uh, mm-hmm. in that in that regard. Your revision, you're, you're, you're bringing up Peter's point about revision, I feel is really important. Um, I've learned it's best if I have distance from a piece of work when I revise it, mm. primarily because I, I can bring a level of going back to um, encounters, fresh encounters. It's almost like a, I'm, I'm a new being Mm-hmm. than when I first wrote it. And the long time that I have, the longer the amount of time to marinate, have the poem marinate away from me is really good. Yeah. And what I'm listening for is not so much meaning as well, but how does it sound? Mm-hmm. I think sound is so crucial. And mm-hmm. anyone who loves music has to love poetry. They have to be able to hear the linguistic kind of Yep. melodies and um, cadences that uh, poetry brings to us. And I think as poets, we are, uh, we're, we're so driven by that probably more so than the desire to, you know, create some hallmark message or, you know, it's our material language is our, yeah. our oils, our notes, you know. Yeah. Otherwise- We'd be writing prose, probably. Yeah. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> if it were for that, that's the beauties of that language. And some people's, you know, connected to the body itself, right? Mm-hmm. To our heartbeats and the patterns of our breathing, the in and out, which kind of, yeah. Um, but I also thought your point um, about the need for variation is really crucial too, because I think sometimes, um, sometimes when you talk about formal poetry, for instance, there's this sort of assumption um, that um, we're talking about strictly traditional poems that rely on this iambic pentameter that can become, as we all know, um, mm-hmm. really overdone and mm-hmm. put everybody to sleep. And I think it's it's so important that that uh, that we as poets consider the importance of that variation, and, and because that's what makes it sound natural. That's how mm-hmm. both of your you know your your poems um, read because it's true to the cadence of whatever it is you're addressing, and it's. Mm-hmm. I think that's really um, that's really crucial, and for poets to find their own ways of messing up the lines just enough, mm-hmm. you know, that balance, um, um, I think is really important. Well, I think we only have time for maybe one last question, um, and maybe I'll start with you, Major. Do you, would you talk a little bit about um, how you went about putting your book together? I know this most recent book, of course, you are exploring, you know, using the myth of Sisyphus um, in this wonderful book, and um, I. I Let's see, you've got your, your first poem. Um, let's see, is it I Major? And then the second major one. And I, yeah. Major and I, yeah. yeah. Um, so you've got, got sort of bookended, but could you talk a little bit about putting your book together? And then I'd like to hear you also um, talk about that. I'm curious, because there's so many different ways um, of putting books together. And many of, us have, many of us are in the process of, you know, at some point you want to throw them all up in the air and just pick them up. You know? <laughs> but, um, any thoughts about putting your book together. Sure. I I have lived with the poems for a long time, so much so before they're even finding their way in the in a book, um, from the point of, of course, inception, or as we were talking about a word. So here we are with all of these poems. And I have a relationship to the work that first and foremost is I I treasure this life, I treasure this experience. And that's the first thing I wanna say is that the act of putting together the book is one of the, my great pleasures uh, in life. Uh, secondly, I, I'll say is I wanna share this experience with a reader. And so I'm thinking about from the point of contact, from the cover to the first poem, even maybe even sometimes the uh, acknowledgement, mm-hmm. but let's just start with the with the poem itself. I I I am thinking about how a person is going to encounter uh, language, 
sound, metaphor, subject matter? What is the door that I'm opening in the rooms that they are stepping into? So I I think about these highlighted moment moments when they come in and how they exit. And what is the journey like between those two particular points? So Mm -hmm. I think I genuinely think about movement much in the same way that a composer may think about a sonata, you know, what particular themes are reoccurring? Mm -hmm. uh, What is a theme that I want to introduce new, maybe in the middle? Mm -hmm. And also this, for me, with the last book, I'm also thinking about voicing. And often the speaker, as we popularly say, the speaker in the poem can be the, can be the author, and other times it may be a constructed speaker. Mm-hmm. And with this last book, I was most conscious of the fact that this is a book in which I want the reader to, yes, think major, but also think about the other selves that we inhabit, in my case, as husband, as teacher, as father, um, as artist, uh, as volunteer on boards, all of those selves create a composite that comes through and comes through the poems. And so I wanted to kind of highlight that just a little bit more um, by creating this abstract itself called major that speaks throughout. And sometimes he gets the title, The Absurd Man. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's a lot of fun for me to put together uh, books because I, I, I treasure the moment. It's as much of a creative and imaginative act as mm-hmm. writing a poem. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. Good. Good. Yeah, I, I agree too. I agree that it's as, as creative as writing a poem. Um, this, the moon jar I felt was easier to put together than uh, this new manuscript that I have, um, which is titled my, which is titled right now, my infinity, but, um, because I felt like I had a story to tell in moon jar and, um, and, 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 and and I wrote poems kind of, my poems followed my story of my life, even as I was writing them. So the book kind of laid itself out. The hard part with in, in ordering moon jar was, um, you know, do I want to start off really hard and heavy with the diff- more difficult subject matter? Do I want to ease my reader into something? That was, I was going back and forth between that. And I was, I received different advice from, and, and you know, I was kind of like test driving it with, with different readers and, sure. and I got different advice, you know, so it's really ultimately it was up to me. Um, uh, and I, I, I wanted a, I put signs for the living up front because I, I felt like it was a good poem to kind of let the reader is a proem so that they could know what's coming. So there's no super surprise. Right. And it lays out the entire book, really. Like it lays out like, yes, it was difficult, but this happens in the end. And I did get through it. And, you know, you too, reader, can get through this, I hope, you know. Um, I noticed that. I think that's working very well. Thank yeah. you. Thanks. Thank you. I um, And so then the rest of it just kind of falls into place um, with what poems I had and, and, uh, I was speaking with somebody in another class. I was speaking in a classroom. I was talking to they, one of the questions that came up was how the images are very like I guess cohesive is the is the right kind of a right word. And I do, I mean, I'm not alone in doing this. I did go back in and try to pull together poems to have a bit of a, a tighter um, imagistic uh, connection, you know. And I think. Uh, after after I saw kind of how the book was going to be laid out and I'm in um yeah that all that was this the, this other book my next book I don't feel like has the story it didn't have us and yeah. and we're so often told rightly or wrongly <laughs> that your book needs an arc or it needs this or there's all these kind of like rules that aren't rules really I mean you know ultimately and uh what'd you say what'd you say rules not rules I love that I rule <laughs> not rules. and um and so it took me a little longer to put this one together and I too wanted to do the 52 card pickup or whatever be like 88 page pickup or whatever it is and just throw the poems in the air and let them land and then say that's the order um 
which would be very Dada, by the way. <laughs> Any Dada artist would really appreciate that kind of exactly. yes. together of the a chance. Yeah, yeah, the chance order. But it did come together. Um, it, the book has um, an artist that I'm kind of, uh, it's kind of rotating around, and that's Hilma off Clint, whose exhibition in 2018, I think it was now, time is weird, might've been 19, I don't know, with COVID, I can't, I don't remember my years, um, but we went to see at the Guggenheim and it was just really amazing. And so I have some work about her and that in the next collection. And so it, but you're right, like one of the things I like to curate or liked, that I like doing, it was like, where are the highs and the lows in the book? Like where, where do, where does the reader get lifted? Where does the get reader get laid back, laid down softly and gently? Where does the reader get shocked a little bit? So right. all thinking about all of that and thinking about how the poems will dictate that. And I am in control of that is really exciting. And so I, I agree major that it is, it's as exciting as writing a poem, if not more so, because then you can kind of see all of them, but then also it's a little stressful because you're like, do I put this one in? Do I not put this one in? You know, there's all of that. So yeah, it can feel a little daunting too. Yes. Can, I add, can I add to that a little bit? Uh, when people encounter a book, they see the author, and indeed, the author is uh, the, the the chief maker. Going back to the meaning of 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 poem, um, but something you said, Didi, is uh, feedback from friends are so crucial and it's such a I don't think many people realize the extent to which writing a book is not a singular act but a, mm. a act of collaboration mm -hmm. and that can be through workshops or festivals like like mm -hmm. writers in paradise mm -hmm. uh, a lot of folks see those poems in advance uh, and and maybe even see the full manuscript and, and give feedback uh, that way. Yeah, that's a great, a great point. So I wish we had another hour to. Uh, <laughs> yes, we, we talk had to talk more. about your own process, Helen. <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh, no, but it's, it's really <laughs> terrific to, to have you both um, in our series. We've been wanting to do it for a long time. So thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you for joining us. And um, I look forward to having you down here and remember that when you do come back, uh, even if you're coming for Writers in Paradise, please let us know when you get in town, if you'd like to go over and, and go through the museum, we'd love to have you as our, our guests, um, please. So, yeah. but, um, and to the rest of you, thank you so much for joining us for the Dolly Poetry Series um, this evening. And uh, remember to tell other friends if they're not able to tune in, we, we will continue to keep the programs up. Um, at the Dolly YouTube channel. So you can tune in anytime and uh, we will look forward to having you back here. So Dee Dee and Major, goodbye and thank you. Stay thank safe. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye.